Okay, and uh, just um, to get started, uh, how long would you like me to go? I you probably sent out that information, so I apologize. Yeah. Um, no, that's okay. We uh, usually go for about an hour, and you can ask questions in between, and then we block an hour and a half just because we found we were having more and more questions. If you okay. finish before the hour and a half, it's okay. If you uh, go to the hour and a half, that's okay. And if people need to drop off and they can't stay on for the hour and a half, that's okay. But we're just, I'm really excited to have Brett Joseph with us today. And just to give him a little bit of an introduction, Brett comes to us with a um, um, background in law. He's had uh, law practice since what, 2007? Was it 2007? Yeah. Okay. And, um, and then has done a lot of sustainable work in the community and is currently running for Lieutenant Governor of Ohio. So he's quite busy these days. So Brett, I'm going to let you take it away and enter and provide any other introduction that I missed. Okay. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, yeah, I mean, my prior to 2007, I was working 15 years with the federal government. I, um, uh, I was an attorney with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So, um, uh, you know, that's, as time has gone on, uh, and, and as Dee mentioned, uh, Dee, I uh, am currently running for Lieutenant Governor uh, on the Green Party ticket in Ohio. Uh, so we're the only third party uh, candidacy on the ballot. We ran unopposed. So now we're going, looking five months from now towards the general election. and. Uh, that's an organizational challenge in and of itself. It's a different way, different kind of organizational challenge, working with uh, volunteers and working on a statewide basis. Um, so it's really interesting how um, some of the skills and competencies that um, that one acquires, both working in government and then working, you know, working at the community level. And then my other, my, my day job these days is um, teaching at the community college. I'm a program coordinator and um, an adjunct faculty teaching uh, in a program for sustainable agriculture uh, that started back in 2012 under a, a USDA grant. And um, I'm finding that very fulfilling. I'm also teaching environmental studies uh, with a local liberal arts college, uh, Hiram College. Um, and I'm finding that, uh, you know, just, the, just uh, I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy working with the students um, uh, as as an adjunct faculty uh, in you know on these uh, courses that are um, uh, you know that that I'm challenge me to uh, take some of these cutting edge ideas around uh, transforming our agricultural system or addressing complexity in the context of, for example, climate resilience. Um, and the whole range of, of complex environmental issues that uh, are of interest to the students as they're looking, you know, uh, towards their careers and helping and, and seek out those career opportunities for those students working, you know, and doing a lot of community outreach and just trying to build that, that network and, and those pathways so that, um, um, you know, so that I can hopefully make a difference uh, in, in these different roles that I'm playing. Um, so, um, and then, and then, in addition to that, most relevant to the topic that I um, that I took up for my dissertation, uh, I I completed my dissertation two years ago in the spring of uh, 2016. So I'm a little over two years out from having uh, uh, having finished uh, my program at Saybrook. Um, just as further background, I I. Um, Prior to that, I, I was with Saybrook a long time. I uh, started in the psychology program and I earned my master's degree in humanistic and transpersonal psychology. Uh, and then after a few years came back to, um, to uh, go into the organizational systems program. Um, so I, I made that change as a, a number of students, I think uh, did, that, you know, went from psychology to organizational systems. And I'm glad I did because I, I really uh, found uh, what I learned in, in the SABRE program, highly relevant, and I draw from it literally every day in terms of, um, you know, the, um, you know, all, all the, all the learning that, that occurred there. 
Um, so, uh, but but I was going to mention the current activity is uh, I'm co-chair of uh, a volunteer group called uh, Cleveland Vital Neighborhoods, and that is a work group uh, that was created out of a an initiative launched by the mayor of Cleveland uh, way back in 2009. Uh, it's, it's a, um, a sustainability initiative that was a 10-year initiative. It's actually going to be uh, culminating next year, and then uh, a lot of the conversations about then what happens next. But uh, it consisted of every year, um, a, uh, the, the city would organize a uh, stakeholder-led designing conference, a large uh, gathering of community stakeholders uh, and, and everything from high school students, you know, that, that have come, ev come out every year, um, as well as visitors uh, from outside the, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, members from the philanthropic community, various nonprofits, uh, leaders in the business community, uh, just, just a real uh, rich gathering of stakeholders, as well as just residents, you know, people uh, that inherently have a stake because they live in the na neighborhoods of the city of Cleveland to uh, brainstorm uh, under an, a, uh, an appreciative inquiry format. That's basically how it had been organized procedurally. Uh, and then from that process each year to spin out new uh, ideas, some of which actually evolved into businesses or, or startup nonprofits. Uh, and in a few rare cases actually created working groups that just continued as informal and very open-ended working groups. And the, so the Cleveland Vital Neighborhoods Group um, was one of the, the first ones to be developed in um, 2009. I joined it uh, the following year in 2010 and have, and then later, you know, became more and more involved with it. Um, and uh, the, the basic mission of that group uh, which, you know, with the membership kind of ebbing and flowing on an annual basis uh, based on uh, people's time and, and, and interest uh, has been to, uh, to really look at uh, how kind of inquire and then try different approaches to how we can build community, specifically place-based community um, in uh, Cleveland's 34 distinct neighborhoods. So I'm going to, um, that, that was actually the context for my dissertation, and I'm continuing to be involved in that group uh, with some new initiatives, which I'll speak to towards the end of this presentation. But I'll go ahead and um, bring up my PowerPoint here with the screen share function. Um, and actually, I'm going to use a PowerPoint that I presented, that I utilized um, the summer after completing my dissertation, uh, when I presented it at the, um, the annual meeting of the uh, ISSS, the International Society for the System Sciences. Uh, the title of my dissertation, uh, as you can see, is the Urban Village as a Living System, Building a Generative and Caring Local Economy and Society Through Strategic collaboration. Uh, so even there you can see I'm you know kind of taken on it's a mouthful a lot of different um, uh, perspectives woven into that uh, but just to set the context uh, the place is the city of Cleveland. I was born and raised in the city of Cleveland um, and uh, notwithstanding the outcome of this year's NBA playoffs uh, at the time I just the summer I did the dissertation uh, we were the NBA champs, and, and that was uh, huge in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, the boost for community pride. Um, Cleveland has a long history of uh, introspection around its identity, going all the way back to, um, you know, the years of uh, the Burning River, which uh, actually there's multiple times that the Cuyahoga River burned due to um, you know, to effluence, uh, which was actually uh, one of those those benchmark events that launched a lot of the uh, what is considered the modern environmental uh, movement. Also, um, other historic events like the uh, uh, the race riots in Huff following 
uh, in the summer after uh, you know the tr troubled period uh, actually this preceded uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King but um, there was just a lot of the uh, struggles around race um, in this case where they actually called in the Ohio Guard that was a different era a different time but Cleveland suffered a lot of really bad press and a, and a lot of um, you know just just a lot of uh, uh, social divisions and, and, and com pre complex problems that it's been working through ever since. Um, good news is that, uh, you know, this is Cleveland today. You know, we have, um, you know, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're, we're really um, uh, doing a lot around uh, urban redevelopment. Uh, that's a picture of uh, 4th Street in Cleveland where, you, you know, you have a lot of um, you are seeing more development utilizing themes of walkable communities, creating uh, common spaces. Uh, we have a bike share program. We have, you know, creating bike lanes. And a lot of these uh, efforts have come out of that Sustainable Cleveland initiative that I mentioned. Um, I mentioned that Cleveland has uh, 34 distinct neighborhoods. This is a map developed by the City Planning Commission of those neighborhoods. Um, and it's a reflection of the history of how the city uh, developed. Uh, it's developed very rapidly in the mid 19th century around and then uh, was really populated very rapidly around the turn of the, the 20th century uh, by uh, mostly immigration. Uh, so uh, as it went from just a small port town to, uh, to a, a major American city, uh, it never to this day, never really had a unified uh, community identity uh, that wasn't somewhat balkanized, uh, not not just by racial separation, but but through most of its history by by uh, the emergence of different ethnic enclaves, um, which you know ha has its positives, but it also has its challenges. Um, and then those communities then have each gone through. Uh, their own evolution as uh, Cleveland, like uh, most of the uh, cities from the industrial rust belt, if you will, from this part of the country, um, uh, has undergone uh, uh, major changes in the economy and demographic changes with um, um, uh, a history, a legacy of, of uh, Going back to the redlining in the um, mid 20th century, and particularly in you know the 1950s and that period, um, and if you don't know about what redlining is, this was at where the federal government, uh, in uh, in cahoots with uh, the real estate industry and um, local governments, uh, actually created urban ghettos by. Um, by establishing zones that would, um, you know, that, that would direct uh, lending for housing purchases, housing developments away from certain parts of the city based on racial criteria. Um, again, that's a different era, but that legacy is literally written on the land. And you can see now where there's an overlay of, um, between that and where we see a lot of the the most uh, challenging urban problems, uh, high rates of infant mortality, uh, toxic hotspots, and I could add on top of that food deserts. Uh, you see a lot of that concentrated on the near east side of Cleveland, those red areas. Uh, and then of course in 2008, um, like again the rest of the country, um, but uh, in, in our own particular um, uh, you know, unequal way, we uh, were hit by the foreclosure crisis, which caused uh, a, a virtual emptying out of the city. So the story of Cleveland has been declining population, and and you can imagine what that does to the tax base, city services, and the ability of, and and, and most importantly, and most pertinent to this presentation, the sense of community. Uh, when you get below a certain um, uh, population level at the neighborhood level, you're creating a vacuum where you know, obviously something's going to move in the vacuum. So we had, you know, you know, you have the challenges there with increases in crime, increases in drug use and so forth, as well as um, uh, just the, the unraveling of the community cohesion 
which as I mentioned, never really was there um, once these, you know, uh, once the population started em emptying out. Um, and so to set a vision of having all these 34 neighborhoods uh, develop a common identity uh, that isn't just a, um, superficial in terms of branding. Obviously, we can we can rally around our sports teams, at least the basketball. <laughs> but you know, the Cleveland fans, you know, the the, the worst losingest team in football is, you know, there's there still is a lot. There's a deeper level to that, which um, uh, I think um, uh, speaks to the importance of of like. You know, when you have have people that live in a community that are just hungry to find some sense of community, and and uh, and you know, and and um, uh, looking for wherever they can find that. Um, so our ideal that uh, those of us who have been involved with the Cleveland Vital Neighborhoods Initiative is to really imagine what is possible. You know, and, and an unfulfilled potential that's within this community. And uh, that ideal has been affirmed when we've had visitors come in. We just had, for example, um, and I apologize, I forget his name, but uh, uh, the, uh, the City Club Forum, which is a, uh, it's a weekly forum uh, for a presentation on different issues of the day. We had a, um, an author and a professor from Columbia University that came and visited Cleveland for the first time. Uh, that was uh, an expert in city planning and looked at Cleveland and, and said to us in Cleveland, you may not realize it, but there's a, uh, what I could see just in, in, in a short 24 hour visit was a, was a lot of potential there um, that, uh, uh, and, and some of the challenges that we see on the East Coast and the West Coast that, um, that uh, we're, we're not as acute here. Um, I think he was probably looking at the fact that we have some, some assets, a lot of green spaces and a lot of, um, a lot of community engagement already. And so this is an example of some of the different uh, organizations that have been real leaders around um, uh, this, this reinvention of our city. Uh, and you can see some of the themes there, you know, place matters, uh, environmental health watch, uh, they, they're an or, a nonprofit organization that's been uh, working with uh, residents very directly from household to household to uh, remediate lead uh, poisoning in their soils and in their, in their water uh, systems. Uh, we are fortunate in Ohio, under Ohio law, there we, we have a CDC law that's community development corporations, which provides a means for democratic engagement in city planning. Uh, so that's, that's a formal legal mechanism that we, we utilize formally. Uh, um, fully. Uh, and the Cleveland Neighborhood Progress is a philanthropic organization that does a lot around building, like repurposing of old buildings uh, and uh, schools and, and other community spaces to, um, you know, to support economic and community development. Uh, community Shares also provides a funding source. And I could also add uh, the organization is part of a national organization. Uh, IOBY, it's called In Our Backyard, a crowdsourcing fund that, uh, you know, that uh, any startup group can tap into to uh, fund community projects. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, every year, all these groups gather in a, um, in a summit. Uh, this is a picture at that particular year, they had the, the earth there, it's a very environmental themed. Uh, we have keynote speakers, but then most of the time is spent uh, organizing into these tables and and so, you know, self-organizing groups to I, um, uh, engage in ideation around uh, what is possible. Um, so you know, in past years we've uh, organized neighborhood mini summits. We've taken that same idea of the you know the annual summit and said, well, that's great when we have all these. Uh, philanthropists, community leaders. Uh, we had, you know, a lot of people coming in from the, the, the suburbs, but uh, not enough people from within the neighborhoods themselves. So let's, let's take it, you know, there, there's reasons for that. Um, oftentimes the word doesn't get out or, um, uh, you know, people in the neighborhoods may not feel uh, comfortable coming in to such a large group setting with all these movers and shakers uh, of uh, society. And, uh, and so 
let's, you know, so the idea is, well, let's take it into the neighborhoods and, and organize these mini summits. Let's go to the places where people live and, and, and gather already. And uh, that was very successful. Then outcomes from that were brought into the larger summit. So that's all in the way of context. Um, I uh, decided because uh, I had been um, uh, doing a lot of exploration through my essays uh, and, and working with uh, faculty, uh, my dissertation chair, Nancy Th Southern, um, uh, was you know uh, very supportive of um, uh, my undertaking a dissertation using action research as the methodology. Uh, I went into it eyes wide open, realizing that action research um, uh, was not very common, and that uh, in fact, a lot of in a lot of other institutions, um, faculty were actually dissuading students from undertaking action research. Uh, it, it, you know, there's a there's a whole long history of action research, but it's been rarely used. For specifically for uh, dissertations, uh, because it um, on face in first impression, you know, there, it, it doesn't tend to fit well with the um, you know the, the standard template of how dissertations are done. Um, and I saw that, that as a challenge. I re, you know I was really um, mindful of the ethical stance of participatory action research. Which is that you know if, if if particularly if the if the interest is in um, community revitalization, how can you conduct research without uh, a methodology that involves community participation? It made no sense. It seems, it seems like it would be just replicating the um, you know the the model of uh, I'm the expert, I'm coming in here, and I know best, and uh, and that that can be very problematic and downright unethical uh, in my view. I, you know, I submit that that um, that uh, as um, as we go forward, the you know I was reading from Bella Banathy, who who actually states it as an eth ethical premise that no social system should be designed without the direct par participation or at least the opportunity for participation of the stakeholders who are going to live within that system and. Um, um, uh, you know, and, and, and its outcomes. Uh, so I had multiple aims for the study uh, to build a cohesive social fabric and strengthen community amidst cultural and demographic plurality uh, and the ongoing critical deconstruction of scientism and uh, homo economists. So um, nowadays, uh, you know, as, um, as a politician and as I further engage in the community, I've, you know, I, I've really been, um, it's interesting because I realized just how quickly one becomes jargony and, uh, you know, using a lot of esoteric language. But uh, I think it's in the context of a dissertation, it's appropriate. Um, I was I was really uh, deeply literature about uh, how we need to really transform the, um, uh, if, if we are to, um, Evolve to self-evolve towards a more sustainable society. We need to uh, really transform uh, the way we uh, have commodified ourselves and commodified all living things um, through uh, the, you know, the the often untested premises premises of the neoliberal market-based economy uh, uh, at all levels, um, and how that has, you know, unless we address that, we're not going to be effective at community placemaking. That was one of my assumptions. It was a, um, you know, it was reflected in the literature, but uh, here's an opportunity to test that in practice. And then also deconstruction of scientism uh, through use of uh, the methodology of action research, which is, um, uh, um, you know, thinking about causation more as patterns of causation and applying um, a lot of the insights of complexity theory, looking at the community as really uh, a, a, a life form, a self-organizing system that, uh, that has potential to, to evolve in the direction of 
um, complexity, which, um, you know, reflecting on the works of uh, uh, Bahá'í, Chinsit Bahá'í, consists of diversity plus uh, integration. And, and that that, as applied to a social system, uh, could give rise to the emergence of unfolding potentials, which brings in the, the, uh, the whole uh, area of evolutionary theory. Um, and, and that's consistent with, you know, a lot of the, the uh, conversations we had uh, around um, evolu evolutionary learning community. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that, uh, as a Saberg student, I really wanted to explore. So I'll move through this quickly. Uh, secondly, to operationalize a more holistic approach to socioeconomic value creation, um, thinking of values beyond just simply economic terms, but values in terms of all the other quality of life metrics, as well as environmental um, uh, metrics. Uh, so, uh, you know, translating that into the public policy realm, you know, that could lend support to, uh, for example, using uh, metrics like the gen genuine progress indicators instead of GNP. Uh, and it's particularly relevant to community placemaking because the value you're creating um, oftentimes is of a qualitative nature, but can be, um, you know, with, with further effort, can be translated into reliable um, quantitative metrics so that you can track progress. To instantiate critical, purposeful, and participatory inquiry via the praxis of designing conversation within the place-based community setting. So um, there we're talking about the um, designing conversation, uh, drawing from work of David Bohm and, and others, uh, that the conversation itself uh, is not just a means to an end, but uh, by engaging in um, in a generative and a purposeful conversation that that can become the vehicle for transformation of the community system. Uh, and then designing conversation in particular as being that um, of the different typologies of conversation, a di designing conversation is a conversation that is ideal seeking um, and that uh, uh, invites uh, in a generative way, invites creative um, uh, testing of ideas and, uh, you know, and presencing, uh, you know, similar to the work of Otto Scharmer, which is all about designing. Um, so that, that was also very relevant and, and I wove that into my methodology. To create socio-ecological conditions that are favorable to the thriving of life in all its complexity. That points more to the implementation um, and uh, uh, again, uh, looking at the system as being not just a, um, a social system, but a socio-ecological system. This is the essence of placemaking. It is making that connection between um, the physical place itself, which itself is a living system, uh, both the living forms, but also just the structures, you know, the, the, uh, the culture that is written on the land that, you know, that, that carries the memory of everything that came before, as well as just the effects as we're seeing more and more uh, uh, through, through works um, such as um, Richard Louvre and others talk about uh, vitamin N and, and you know, nature, uh, uh, encounters with nature as uh, directly uh, affecting our public health. And now we're seeing, uh, you know, other works around how just the physical place not only shapes our health, but also shapes the way we think and shapes the way we uh, engage with each other. Uh, so it's dealing with that level of complexity between the dynamic, the, you know, the interpersonal dynamics, the intersubjective dynamics of people that bring with them their uh, unique uh, cultural and, and individual experiential backgrounds times the you know, the effects of the, the spaces that they're in. And, uh, and it's interesting now, uh, again, on reflection, seeing a lot of work being done by geographers and, uh, you know, across the disciplines uh, around the, the experiential aspects of 
space and place and translating spaces into places. Uh, I really like the term placemaking because I, I didn't use that very much in my dissertation, but in retrospect, I realized that that's really what this was about is, is um, you know, is, is going from the, um, it's just the objective or the kind of the, the sense of a, a space as um, filled with potentials to something that is actually created intentionally, which is place. And then finally, to generate learning and social change dynamics that lead to common understanding, not just knowledge. So looking for deep learning, transformative learning in the process. Um, okay, so. So Brett, can I yeah. just interrupt for a second? Um, we have a question. Would sure. you mind waiting or, or we can take all the questions at the end, whatever you would rather do. Yeah, I, we, we could take the questions now while, while, they're, um, while they're brought up. And uh, I don't even need to go through this in, in a linear way. Um, I wanna, you know, uh, uh, make it as relevant to what you're interested in hearing. Um, okay. So yeah, let's hear the question. Okay, Jim. Um, hey, Brett. Hi, how you doing, Jim? Good. Um, this is super, super exciting what you're, what you're rolling out here. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, Allison did a whole thing. Um, Allison Stern did her dissertation on uh, place and space. And uh, yeah. a big theme was identity. And I'm just wondering, the socio-ecological conditions of placemaking if you see a relationship with identity formation. Yes, absolutely. Um, when, and, and you know, there's various definitions of what place is, you know, it's, it, that's, what, what really fascinates me is that placemaking is already being used um, outside of academia quite a bit. And, um, and so what, you know, that being the case, um, uh, I think as academics, we want to avoid presuming that we can define for the culture what that means. So I, however, observing the way that I'm seeing that concept uh, being understood and used in dialogue, you know, in the, in the continued work in this field, um, it is clear to me that it has a lot to do with identity. That, um, in fact, we, we toggle between, we being, you know, the, the work group that I'm on um, and the workshops that we're conducting uh, tend to toggle between talking about creating a sense of community pride, creating a sense of collective identity, and making the place, you know, a sense, we, we talk about place as a sense of place. So that's invoking kind of the holistic um, interweaving of aesthetics, function, and, um, and, and identity. Um, it's also, I think one of the other tie-ins to identity is the notion that every place is unique. Uh, that every place uh, has its unique uh, physical features and its unique combination of um, a people that, you know, that make the place, make, make it um, a place uh, that is a part, uh, part of a human community. Uh, and even a, po a, a transhuman community, you know, is, is the relationship of humans and other life forms in that place. So mm -hmm. it's all about identity. Um, and, uh, and I think that's relevant uh, in, 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 and important, especially as um, you know, as, as we struggle with things like identity politics, much of which is becomes divisive. And yet when we think of place and the relationship between place and identity, uh, I can't help but to imagine that if it's handled right, it can be grounding and unifying. Um, so uh, place, developing place, in, and, and the identity that emerges from that in a manner that also um, encourages and enables people to enter into a, um, um, a pluralistic dialogue with people from other places, a sharing, you know, a, and, and a celebration of difference. Just as we do that between individuals, we can do that between communities. 
So a lot of the themes that I try to develop here in the dissertation is, is taking ideas that uh, are, are um, maybe more familiar when we're talking about uh, uh, dialogue across difference between individuals and, and then exploring, well, is, is there a collective consciousness that can emerge? Is there a place-based consciousness? Um, you know, what, what happens when you move into the collective, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the collective field? And what I'm finding is that we have really ignored that, you know, in, in, in this, in Western culture generally, but particularly in the US, um, we are a very individualistic culture and it's written into our laws and um, and in, in in our media culture and so forth. Everything is all focused on the atomistic individual as the center of all uh, concern, uh, whether we're talking about celebrity worship or, or what have you. Um, and, uh, and yet the, the great need now is for coming together uh, and, and um, building community. Um, so, and, and then of course, overlay on top of that, that the, um, the place making is not just a given because of the social media and all the different distractions we have that pull us away from place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll add one further point to that, which is that um, whether you're living in rural communities or in the urban centers, uh, you have this intergenerational dynamic where a lot of the young people have been told that their greatest aspiration should be to leave that place, to find Mm -hmm. you know, the, green, the grass is greener elsewhere. And we've seen the brain drain from the urban communities. We've seen a similar pattern in the urban communities. And yet the urban communities and the rural communities themselves rarely uh, identify that they have a, a common commonality of that experience. So um, this is all playing out, uh, you know, in, in, in my world in the context of Northeast Ohio. Um, but yes, sorry, long answer. It's all about <laughs> identity. <laughs> But I, I just want to piggyback really quickly because what you stimulated yeah. there for me was like, how do you handle this diversity? And it seems like nested identities make some sense. So we have diversity within our family, but mm -hmm. we're a family, you know, and then we have diversity on our block, but we're a block, but we're in a neighborhood. If I have an identity as a neighborhood and as a part of Cleveland and as a part of the Midwest and as part of the U.S., that the nested identities Mm -hmm. allow diversity at each level but allow identity that pulls us together yeah i wonder about that sort of multi-level ecosystem yeah and i think um you know and i'm speaking from a cleveland perspective you know intentionally uh and i i, I realize if you're outside of cleveland it, it probably sounds very parochial and all that but i think it is a and you know it it, it i would expect someone's from, you know, from Brooklyn or from the West Coast, you know, speak from, from their places. And I, and I think that um, uh, if we do it in an appreciative way, what I have found is exactly that, that, uh, you know, that if, if I'm in the context of um, a community conversation or uh, one of these conversations that is trying to network between neighborhoods within this, you have identity emerging at that level but uh if i travel to a conference like recently you know i was in new orleans and talking to people and saying i'm from cleveland well technically i'm not from cleveland i live in the county next door <laughs> but i you know but i that identity suddenly fuses with the entire metropolitan area um i don't think it's you know it's, that only happens in cleveland um you know if you're you may be from uh Newark and, and you go to the West Coast, you're from New York. I, I don't know. I guess it depends. Um, but but yeah, the, that identity is multifaceted and that makes it really interesting um, uh, that uh, that within the our identity construct as as individuals and as members of multiple communities at multiple levels that uh, that how we form that identity and how we express that identity is going to be shaped by the context in which we're having those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, great okay. question. Brett, thank you. We've got one more question sure. on the list, but I think it might fit in your findings area because it's about, you know, what did you find? Okay. So, 
So I'm going to, I'm going to table that until you get to findings. Okay. Okay. So, uh, again, let's, I'll just move through this methodology quickly so we can get to findings. Um, key constructs, uh, I already, already mentioned uh, designing conversation, appreciative systems. I use that term. That's a, um, that's a reference to systems using the term appreciative in the sense of awareness. Okay. We, we, we talk about, you know, I appreciate the, you know, the flower bouquet that you brought, you know, that's, that's one kind of appreciation, but uh, I'm using the term appreciative in the sense that, for example, Otto Scharmer uh, might use it um, and other systems thinkers, which is the ability to, um, you know, to uh, take in and, and be aware of uh, other world views or, or, you know, using our imaginal capacities to, to try to see from the other perspective. And when you have that happening, both directions or multiple directions, it becomes a system in and of itself um, that uh, is the kind of system that can, um, you know, that can allow for something to emerge out of that difference. Evolutionary potential, uh, that's, you know, the idea that uh, with each evolutionary move, each evolutionary change, there is an unfolding of potentials and also the creation of new potentials. And so that it's, it's a never ending process that uh, when we apply that to the community context, it, it ties in with the idea of an asset based approach where we're looking at what, you know, instead of looking solely at the deficits in the community, what are the potentials within that community that are ready to unfold at this particular uh, uh, moment in its evolving history? Place based community, we talked about that already. A self-organization uh, that's hinting at uh, complexity theory that um, that the organization should be occurring from within, and that's also consistent with the uh, the participatory nature of action research. Um, so let's see here. Uh, yeah, drawing from uh, Banathy, uh, Jen Lake, some of the other um, definitions uh, in the literature around designing conversation. Um, and it and it's tying with systems theory and philosophy, um, and that it's ideal seeking. Uh, the practical significance, which is always important to spell out in the dissertation, uh, the intention there was to validate and encourage propagation of community action research as a viable approach to conscious evolutionary design that supports these uh, emerging attributes of, of vibrant communities as. And I, I hear now I'm adding the term resilience, which uh, uh, is being used more and more along with sustainability when we're talking about, for example, climate resilience, the ability of communities to, um, to bounce back. Uh, and it also is, is, is referencing the context, the larger context where we have so many changes happening on a global scale that, um, that if, as we're seeking what, what are the ideal qualities that we want to generate in a given community, one of those things uh, in all likelihood is gonna be the ability to, um, to, to roll with those changes and to be able to bounce back from the um, uh, more and more frequent disturbances we have. We're fortunate here in Northeast Ohio uh, to have a fairly uh, stable climate, but even then we're, even here, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, appreciating what's happening in the rest of the world with, you know, droughts and, and hurricanes and floods, you know, we, you know, we're seeing those changes as occurring as well. And of course, um, uh, you know, ec the, through the economic uh, uh, system and so forth, it, it, it it affects us all. We're, we're in an interdependent situation. The methodology, community action research, let's see, um, engaging in collective intelligences uh, to cultivate a unified appreciative awareness. Okay, spoke to that. Um, okay, this is probably going in a little bit more depth than I need to at this point, but uh, it's just, what this is, is doing a little bit of a crosswalk between um, for example, how you would, you know, how you apply the methodology 
in the conventional type of dissertation that would uh, be using a um, traditional met quantitative methodologies, for example, versus how you do it in the context of community action research. Um, so action research has been used in the organizational setting uh, quite a bit. Um, I added the word community. I, I mean, I didn't coin that term, but uh, you know, like, uh, uh, Peter Senge wrote an article about it that was in the action research manual along with Otto Scharmer. Um, but it's, you know, it's in the particular context of community where community is, is a, a very fluid concept. Um, uh, so from a methodology standpoint, uh, you have to really um, start with the researcher's best guess, as it were. Uh, um, it's, there's not a whole lot of um, uh, tried and true examples of how, you know, what is the best way methodologically to approach uh, conducting action research at the community level. Um, what I attempted to do here is to utilize uh, some of the conceptual tools developed uh, in the literature, uh, Bella Banathy and the literature around evolutionary systems thinking, as well as, um, you know, uh, the um, concept of uh, the social system as having a basic architecture, um, you know, where you're looking both at flows and structures. So it's applied systems thinking and the challenge methodologically uh, in that is to not inundate your participants with a whole lot of theory because mm -hmm. you're going to lose them very quickly. So as a researcher, you have to, you know, be, become very familiar with the theory and then, and then, and then really try to make that translation. How does, how does what looks really elegant and, and really compelling uh, in theory, how's that going to work out in this specific context um, when you, you know, when you have such specialized language and when you talk about a design architecture, you design, you talk about, you know, I mean, all these terms, design inquiry, I, you know, you have to, if you're going to use that term, you really, you're going to have to spell out what that means when you're working with people that just are not familiar with, with systems thinking in general. Um, so it's, it's almost like, and what I found in, in, um, in conducting the research is that I would apply the theory mostly in how I would prepare for each group conversation and, and in make, and in engaging in that preparation, I would try to, um, select words and ways of describing what we're doing, um, based on what I thought the participants would, would understand, but also challenge the participants to think outside of their own mental uh, frames. That was the common intention. Um, I, I um, structured it at two levels where I had a core group, which uh, were people that already had some facilitation skills and were already um, activists in community uh, placemaking it's in some way and then the larger community uh, which was another conversation where uh, my participants would join me in um, you know in, in applying some of these in, in leading some of these conversations um, at a, a an open public workshop um, and then the I also structured the methodology so that it would go through uh, several cycles in an iterative process, which is what you want to do in action research, uh, where you're going between the planning, the, uh, the designing, the implementation, and then uh, gather, you know, implementing and, and uh, reflecting and gathering that feedback and then um, redesigning for the next cycle. This is a very busy diagram. Um, it's not one that I, um, that I used in the, in the general public uh, way, but it's a way of kind of thinking about how I would organize uh, through several stages. And in order to capture the sense of evolution, it's not just a, you know, like the cycle itself has to move. 
and you see the, that uh, upward arrow of evolutionary learning, uh, the idea there is that, um, that with each cycle, when you're moving from, uh, from the early stages where you're just trying to, to establish some common understandings uh, around the constructs and, and form some common intentions, a lot of that is, is um, just getting everyone on the same page as far as the methodology itself to the second cycle, which is where you really now, now that you, you, you uh, established those, those um, foundational competencies, you actually engage in the process of co-creative design to the third cycle where you're uh, then trying to move that design into a deeper place where uh, it's uh, more reflective and uh, and more of the attention is shifting towards what is emerging that might be unexpected or, or might be uh, transformative both personally and uh, in, in, in terms of the emergence of a sense of collective consciousness in, within the group. And so this is how I conceptualized it. The, um, the outcomes would be to track, to find ways to track whether these things are actually occurring. In, in the process. Um, another way to describe that is in a scaffolding uh, between different phases, group formation, it, you know, you, you have the forming, storming, norming, you know, that, that kind of idea with any small group. Um, it, here with an evolutionary learning community, the, uh, the scaffolds would consist of capacity building and then, uh, then moving it into the practice setting uh, getting into the design conversation um, in that self-organizing way and then uh, reflecting on, on the outcomes. Uh, some of the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, so in order to set the stage, even to get into you know, the, the process of convening, which is a very important part in action research, you know, how do you select your group? Uh, how do you do so in a manner that is um, where the participants are coming into it as, um, you know, as uh, co-inquirers? That's one of the pl places where action research really differs from conventional methodologies. Conventional methodologies, you're the, you're the researcher, they're the research subjects. But in action research, um, you know, the question arises, Okay, I have my particular research objective, which is to complete a dissertation and to, I, and, and to um, harvest some of these particular learning outcomes that can be documented according to, you know, the, the, the literature that I've been exploring. But then you have to ask your fellow participants, what's your stake in it? What is your, you know, I've kind of provided this platform, this opportunity as a convener, but I invite the participants to um, to be explicit about what they hope to get out of the process and then try to, uh, to uh, structure your action research methodology so that um, it's accommodating of that without, without losing um, your, you know, your, your ability to achieve the intended outcomes that are needed in order for this to be, um, um, you know, the basis for a dissertation. So that, that's a fundamental challenge. Um, and um, what I found was that the participants, uh, once we got through those early conversations, they, they were very much um, bought in. They, they expressed themselves in a way that um, really gave me the sense that they, they were invested in this process. So, um, so that was positive. Um, and really what I was speaking to is number two there, you know, just you have to, to, to provide some space to figure out how, um, how your participants are showing up. Uh, then the first meeting also was a bit of a challenge because uh, I didn't want to be too directive in that meeting um, to where it would narrow the possibilities of what could emerge. Um, so, the way I handled that is I, I, 
again, tried to be very transparent, very explicit about it, saying, you know, at this first meeting, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lay out all of my intentions right up front. And this is intentional. I want to really see what is, um, uh, you know, what, what is emerging in the group. Uh, this is a different, you know, kind of conversation probably for what you've been accustomed to. Most people are accustomed to when they show up in a conversation, you know, you have the convener, you have the chairperson is going to lay out an agenda and we're going to get from here to there. And in fact, anything that, that uh, would take you off on a tangent, you're going to quickly get directed back into this, this um, directive, purposeful, outcomes oriented focus of the meeting. And so I had to really explain to the, to the participants that, uh, that under the, this community action research design, we are trying to do something that is generative um, and not overly directive. Let's see what emerges by just having the dialogue um, led by open-ended questions. Um, and then whatever emerges from that to capture that through, and, and what I did was I recorded it with everyone's permission, and then I would develop a transcript. From that transcript, then I would uh, identify the themes that emerged. I would put those into a summary, and then I would feed that back to the participants uh, for, for their uh, response. Uh, basically saying, this is what I captured, you know, going through, um, the actual literal transcripts of the conversation that we had in the last meeting. And this is what I saw as emerging patterns, emerging themes. Um, does, is that how it looks to you? Or did I get this right? Or is there something that I'm missing here? And would always keep going back to the participants for their feedback. Um, and then uh, the end game there would be to develop a synthesis of all those thematic ideas as they emerge and to, and to see how how those themes evolved over the course of the study. Um, very quickly, so here, here's my seven participants that I had in the core group where I actually did a kind of a mind map um, coming out of that first meeting of the different competencies and the different backgrounds and interests uh, that were represented around the table. And I did it as this, this like complex multi-Venn diagram uh, because uh, I noticed that there was overlap and so you had, right away, you had an opportunity to have a visual representation of the, the diversity and also where there are points of intersection around, for example, um, uh, two or three, in some cases, three or more uh, participants that uh, have particular um, interests and competencies within all these related fields, environmental science, urban planning, diversity management, uh, et cetera. And I, um, you know, this was just one of a number of ways that I tried to reflect back to the group um, in a visual way what was emerging out of the conversation that allowed us to see who we were, you know, so it goes maybe to the issue of identity. Um, And this is what I was just mentioning a moment ago, you know, that there's, there was this, I, I predicted and, um, and, and in fact, from the participant feedback, uh, I did get a sense that there was a, an initial feeling of tension um, as this impulse to get to the task at hand uh, emerged, but then uh, to try to have an agreement to resist that that uh, impulse long enough to to um, give us a chance to uh, what I described here as search amidst uncertainty. We don't know where we're going with all this, but let's just let's just go let's just flow with it for a while. Let's just suspend. Um, I, I think that is a similar idea to Otto Scharmer's idea of of um, presencing and particularly suspension, holding back on the impulse to get to the get to the point or get to the you know get to the outcome right away so there it is theme number two suspending as an intentional practice um, in order to do that however you have to uh, give equal attention to creating a safe container people to you know in order to 
um, to endure a certain amount of dynamic tension in a manner that doesn't just devolve into conflict, but actually goes the other direction and becomes a kind of a, um, a catalyst for creative energy, emergence of creative energy, there has to be a sense of safety uh, that you know participants could um, feel that's okay to raise new issues or to speak at a deeper level or to you know take risks in the social space. Um, and uh, so again, you know that's just part of appreciative awareness. Uh, one of the things that came up in the first meeting, right right from the start, is that we all have these personal triggers. There were a few that went off. Triggers being, you know, when you when you start feeling yourself in that tension, if, and you, and some people are going a little deeper, but also, um, you know, uh, uh, being invited to test assumptions. So one person speaks, and another person is then um, uh, is going to utilize the opportunity of being in a facilitated setting to question in, in a hopefully using a you know nonviolent speech to question the the assumptions that go into the statements of another participant um, very quickly you find where those triggers are and then the move is to let's talk about those triggers and that uh, actually um, uh, serves to build the kind of cohesion and the sense of safety. If you can work through those first few initial triggers that, that tend to emerge, um, then the group can, um, can then reflect on what they're capable of doing. That, you know, so some of those initial fears start to subside that, hey, we can speak to some, we can go into these, these more difficult conversations and it's not going to just lead to, um, you know, to the uh, the familiar patterns of of um, conflict and and um, finger pointing and so forth. Um, okay, so research questions. In retrospect, um, what I found is that you know, I, I framed them as questions, but in this kind of a context, when you're dealing with systemic complexity, uh, you don't necessarily have to frame them as questions. They can be framed as just problem areas that you're trying to work through or um, intentions even. Um, and, and that works in the context of um, community action research. What I uh, set as an intention is to develop three types of knowledge, interpretive systemic knowledge, praxis oriented knowledge, practical knowledge for how, how do we engage in this kind of designing conversation and integral knowledge, which is what can we illuminate? What can we learn about our own potentials in the process? I'm going to jump ahead here and do a time check. Um, let's see. As I mentioned, um, you know, we, we went through uh, several conversations. We did this on a monthly basis. Uh, we actually had four conversations in the core group plus a fifth one that was in a community workshop where we invited about 30 people uh, just randomly from the community. And this occurred uh, during the annual sustainability summit in the se September of, of, of the year 2016, 2015, sorry. Um, and especially when we went into the more public community setting, uh, one of the things that uh, that my co-inquirers and I had um, discovered in the course of our own designing conversations was the value of the open-ended trigger question. And you can call it by different names, but it's basically, um, and here I guess I'm using the term trigger not as like you're triggering a conflict, but it's 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 a a question that um, that invites deeper inquiry. Um, that when in conversation, when you state a proposition, you're um, you're shutting off the dialogue basically, and and inviting challenge or debate or you know oftentimes conflict. 
If you state a question, however, um, you're inviting refinement of the question and you're inviting further open-ended exploration that, that propels the dialogue forward. So what we try to do is, is as much as possible, avoid these, these definitive propositional statements. And even when ideas or conclusions would emerge, we would, we would agree to try to state them as questions so that questions can lead to questions can lead to questions. And, um, and even if we never got to the conclusion, because in an evolutionary process, there really is no ultimate final conclusion. What we're trying to map is what, you know, how are the questions themselves evolving? And then what can we learn from that? I know I have a lot of words up here. Sorry that I didn't, this was, um, I'm just kind of rehashing this old PowerPoint. Um, I'll give you a couple of the visuals here. So this is pointing to results then. So what, so in the first part of the inquiry, our effort was to map the current problem situation as it relates to community and, and the, the, the state the status of, of communities of place in the city of Cleveland. And so these are some of the emerging themes around the problem before we really pivoted to the solution area. Um, the, and what you see here around the outer perimeter are uh, more specific themes that through conversation we attempted to integrate and combine into more, um, you know, more kind of systemic themes that you see in the, the, the three centers and even then there wasn't a single theme. We tried to keep a sense of that plurality of what was emerging. But you can see uh, what emerged there is that there was a high level of uh, distraction uh, that uh, people were experiencing that their daily workload uh, really limits uh, community members' ability to engage in meaningful conversations. There's just not a lot of conversation space available to people uh, given the daily distractions, the daily struggles to survive. Secondly, that people feel a tension between the need for deep resonance and the fear of having the difficult conversations. And I, I would say that, you know, this is 2016, I would say, um, you know, it, given the current uh, further divisions that are uh, happening in the political realm and elsewhere, that that's probably even more so uh, in, in, in many community spaces. Uh, we found that to be the case in our uh, in our inquiry. And then thirdly, uh, people have a short-term view and feel socially isolated, lacking a sense of uh, social, geographic, and intergenerational connection. This sense of isolation kept coming up again and again and again as, um, as something that people were literally suffering from. Um, uh, so, you know, you look at this together, you start to see a picture emerging. You know, we're living distracted lives, we're, le we're, we're isolated, and yet we're a little bit fearful of, of even speaking to our isolation. Um, I gave, you know, I tried to, to capture these themes through short, like headline type phrases, like normal is isolated in the upper right corner there, or we are resigned to nostalgia, or a uh, sense of the ancestral connection broken, uh, ancestral connection is broken, no reason to stay as I mentioned earlier, that what the connection to place seems very weak and why should I even stay here? What's my, you know, it's all I have here is, is um, struggle and wounds and hurts and bad memories. Um, too busy surviving to even think, think about larger issues like, you know, what, what would be the ideal future? So all of these are part of this, this complex problem situation that we find ourselves in in trying to make community. Um, this is plugging in a little bit of the evolutionary theory. Um, again, using uh, uh, systems diagrams um, to take some of those same ideas and explore how, how they relate to each other as a system. So part of the methodology, and this is something that we didn't do in the conversation itself, but I would take the transcripts of the conversation as the raw material to see if I could develop a system diagram out of that to 
uh, to, to try to uh, find the connections. And this is part of that process of integration. So for example, um, uh, you take the number of people in the neighborhood that are engaging in activities that bring them together, uh, which uh, could, you know, when you have the number of people that are um, like less people that are doing that, you know, you find pe that people are not able to pay attention or think about community, but that also um, when you have uh, a certain number of people in the community that uh, are able to devote a certain portion of their vital energies to trying to meet basic needs, that that then uh, has a positive, um, positive in the sense of increasing in system terms, the ability to pay attention and think about community, which in turn then uh, can have a, a um, uh, increasing causal relationship to uh, the capacity to engage in difficult, com meaningful conversations, um, et cetera. So you can kind of explore within that. And then, um, let's see. Then pointing to outcomes, we, we, this is where we're making the, the pivot to uh, the solution space that we're finding that, for example, um, what are the ingredients that allow us to attain certain outcomes? Like, uh, for example, people living under uh, normal life circumstances with a little bit of empathy and a little bit of intention uh, are able to set small goals, which in turn makes it more feasible to achieve those small wins. And then when you celebrate those small wins, I'm just kind of following some of these arrows here. It uh, will reduce the distance between personal realities and shared emerging ideals. Um, and again, you can follow any of these threads uh, and then see where some of these things start to coalesce. Uh, you see there on the far right side, a sense of community co cohesion or having social capital, which then in turn leads into the capacity for effective social engagement and building community at higher levels, uh, feeding back into uh, uh, more network relationships between communities uh, and formal community building processes. Um, let's see. Okay. So. That, that's a great slide right there. That could yeah. take us an hour to like um, look at. Yeah, it would, I, this will I, take an hour and we don't have an hour. So I, I love, I love your slides. Um, so here, uh, try to capture, okay, if I take all these themes, this is all building on the preceding ones, you know, what, what does this ideal future system look like? So Brett, um, can I just, can I interrupt yeah. you for one second? I'm sorry, because I think that G Gemma's question, okay. this is the answer to Gemma's question. She was wanting to know, um, specific characteristics of the conditions that are favorable to thriving of life in all of its complexity. And I would think that this speaks to that. Um, kind of cut out there. State that again. Um, her question was from your research, have you found the specific characteristics of the conditions that are favorable to the thriving of life in all its complexity? Yeah. Um, so, um, the condition, I, I would answer that, that the condition is in the practice, that with the practice of conversation, um, the participants gain experience in what it feels like to be in a generative conversation, a safe in a safe space where um, where it's possible to explore in an ideal seeking way. That experience, the, the condition is if is having kind of a critical mass of you know the 
more and more people that have had that experience that they can draw from mm -hmm. in being able to recreate that kind of a dynamic, that kind of a, a social space mm -hmm. um, in more and more settings where uh, the outcome of that would be um, individual and collective transformation. So it's a, so the condition is, is having the experience itself. Uh, you can refer to that as the capacity because as part of that is also skills building. But that's, that's the internal dimension. The, the external set of conditions is skillful facilitation and you know, facilitation by people that understand um, this or, or you know, that, that, that are committed to exploring the, the idea that the conversation itself matters. The manner in which the conversation is occurring is itself an outcome that, that in other words, by having a very rich, very generative, ideal seeking conversation, even if you don't come away with um, other types of action items, that there is value in the conversation itself. That's, you know, and, and that is something that doesn't just happen because there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's a lot that, a lot of habits that we in, encounter in our workplaces and in, in other types of settings that um, tends to reinforce the idea that if you are in a gathering of people, if you're having a meeting or if you're having any kind of a social interaction that is intended to be purposeful, that doesn't lead to some physical action or uh, a decision on expenditure of money or on um, next steps or whatever, that, that, that that's a failure. So the, the difference here is that the, the conversation itself is valued as fulfilling one of the ingredients that is what communities are made of. Community, we, we give lip service to the idea of social capital. We talk about communities are made, are made out of the relationships and out of the, the shared experiences of people. Um, and I think it's a valid and an important uh, further question that we might ask is, what are the contexts in which these conversations can occur? Sitting around a table or sitting in a room, you know, uh, in a circle of chairs is one context. It's only one context. But could you not have conversations that are generative and meaningful while you're also engaging in some kind of community activity like gardening and so mm -hmm. forth? How can you take this kind of intentional building of social capital and plug it into the, all the different ways in which people gather and interact in the community? both spontaneously, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, if you create a community space, like we're, what we're trying to do now around repurposing some of these um, land bank properties uh, or in a more, more formal se setting. And also, at what point can you transcend the need for a facilitator? You know, at what point does this just become part of the community culture? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, the, 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 there are multiple ingredients, but I would say one of the most important ingredients for this kind of process to, um, to lead to uh, community building and, and all the benefits that come from um, reweaving the fabric of community and connecting it to place, uh, you know, that this, this um, has to do with, with that shared experience of getting through a conversation without following the old patterns mm -hmm. of, um, 
you know, never talk about politics, never talk about religion, never talk about, you know, I mean, we're, we're afraid to have conversations. Mm -hmm. But here, um, you're bringing in intention and a certain set of skills uh, in order to, um, you know, in order to reverse that, that pattern of community unraveling. Uh, and it actually would yeah. go back to like um, creating that space and place that's fertile for these type of interactions. And I'm, and I'm, I have a visual in mind. I went to the farmer's market on Saturday. Yeah. And yeah. as I think back about the interactions or lack thereof between the people milling around, um, that would be a great study in itself to go from area to area just to see how the community comes together like at a farmer's market right. or on the sidewalks. Anyway, that was just, I had to share that because I was having that visuals very strongly. Yeah, and and, um, yeah. and I, I think there's different permutations of this. For example, um, I was down at the uh, conference with my wife and daughter, the uh, American Association of Geographers in New Orleans a couple months ago. And uh, there were one of the workshops uh, had a presentation of someone that uh, did a study of um, the uh, lowrider culture or, or phenomena in uh, in uh, South LA, where you have these um, community gatherings that are truly spontaneous, like creating in a parking lot, a Walmart parking lot, or something like that suddenly a community would come together, they, they would be like sharing food, they would, you know, it would just be doing mm -hmm. all the kinds of things that community people would do, you know, when they slow down. The whole idea of low rider, low rider idea is you drive really slowly, that's called cruising, and you slow down to slow the pace of life mm -hmm. to allow community to happen. And people would walk up and, you know, you know, talk, from their cars or between cars, or they would pull up next to each other and then they would pull out a table. It would be like a, like a flash community happening. Inevitably, then the police helicopters would come in and someone would try to break it up. Guess what would happen? They would emerge on the other side of town and form that community itself. And it speaks to this, this felt need to have community space where the, the physical structures and the legal framework and all these other forces in our urban areas are trying to keep us to be loyal shoppers and keep moving and no loitering and, and all that where what really a lot of people are, are seeking is just an opportunity to gather and interact in a community way. Um, so these th that's just another um, it, was, it was great they did a study around that. I, I you know, I, I was making connections to what we were trying to do here because I was, you know, I was utilizing the opportunity of formal workshops with a formal facilitator, but I, um, you know, I realized that some of these outcomes that are seeing here, which is, you know, slowing down, presencing, um, uh, mm -hmm. meeting our, our basic needs. So sharing food, I mean, I, you don't need a dissertation to, to know that, but it's, it's something that we should remember that, that uh, if you add food to the equation, then people will slow down and they mm -hmm. will, and, and, and food itself when it's shared is another way that people can build that social capital. Um, so there's multiple pathways. There's not a single, um, um, you know, universal ingredient here, but as you can see from this, uh, this mapping of the ideal future system, certain themes did come up consistently. And one was that um, the ability to, to see and recognize that as a community, we are a system. In other words, that system thinking can be cultivated in the community context. And that's huge because mm -hmm. we think of system thinking as being, um, you know, a, a more academic undertaking. However, the, the manner in which system thinking is, is cultivated does not 
it, what, what I found is does require this crosswalk between the way people organically and naturally communicate, the way, the way people use the language within the community context, um, that there is within that uh, plenty of connections to, to systemic awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's the language. I, I keep yeah. going back to the language we use. Yes. And because um, I had a recent conversation about a systems thinking introductory course to somebody that's in business and he's an organization development site guy. And he's like, oh, that's not my area. I'm not interested in that. And I'm like, but you do this every day. Like the concepts I'm sharing is something that you do. Mm -hmm. but, so we better figure out what that language is not to turn off people. Right. Um, in the last mm -hmm. session that we had, I, um, I, uh, as a facilitator, I in invited the participants to do a pivot to um, move outside of a strictly linguistic realm or the, you know, using systems models and to uh, try to translate the, the, the same conversation into a more of an imaginal realm in, in utilizing um, storytelling mm -hmm. as um, as a framework so uh, that was kind of interesting because the uh, what emerged was a um, uh, the kind of um, fluid uh, self-directed story that uh, one might have around a campfire you know where people just like pass along the story and, and carry it forward and and um, what I found from that is that the the conversations that led up to that really shaped and informed the way that the story evolved. And yet by moving into storied language, it made it feel more natural, more, more accessible to talk mm -hmm. about the ideal. Mm -hmm. you know, people can tell a story of what the ideal is, um, of which, you know, you can posit that maybe we're wired that way to, you know, to speak of stories, but that um, uh, from a constructivist perspective, uh, you know, language is always, always has some kind of a narrative behind it. And so making that explicit and making it co-creative within the group, um, I think helped to enhance the, uh, the sense of a common, developing common experience. Um, I don't- Hey, Brett. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can, I, um, can I share something um, kind of from my perspective? Um, this is the kind of way what we call the strength or weak ties because um, I come from a slightly different background. So uh, maybe we can bring some like new um, insights into this. So uh, I was talking with Vienna, um, like the background I come from is mainly complexity leadership theory. So since you use complexity theory is, as one of the theoretical um, guidance for your work. So um, you might be interested in complexity leadership theory and this I see a lot of um, um, like overlapping between oh, between what you're talking about and what I'm learning. So here comes the language part. So complex leadership theory is one of the formal one of the efforts that formally build a theory uh, to guide social social science social systems that uh, is based on insight from complexity theory. So uh, one of the key one of the key um, premises to talk about is information flow. So for a social system, information flow is very important. So what you've been talking about creating this space where people can have generative conversation is really can be translated as create a enabler condition where information can flow more freely, right? So, and that is really um, very inspiring. As a matter of fact, I'm right now working on an NSF grant on transforming um, undergraduate civil undergraduate engineering education. So it's a different context than uh, the work you're working on, but I see a lot of what you're doing I can learn from. So actually I'm thinking in my head a kind of action research project I can do within the department uh, with the faculty members, to start with the faculty members or maybe with the students to kind of creating that kind of a space where we, where we can start to have the, general, the, the conversation where information flow is no longer a lip service, but something concretely we can do, right? And then apart, so in order to like, there were 
in that theory, I'll share the article with you. In the complex leadership theory, there are other things you can do to facilitate um, the, the free flow of information, such as, um, like one thing, talk about interaction and interdependency. And then from there, uh, and then you can do task related conflicts where you have people do like work on one task together and then people bring in diverse perspectives and then there would be conflicts. And then you would work over that conflicts where the information would go through a transformation. So you would arrive at a better way of dealing with this, this task as a result of interaction of diverse perspectives. Yeah. So therefore heterogeneity is very important. And then adaptive pressure where like you and I are very different. And if we work on something together, if you don't do it, I'm gonna think. So we tied together. So this interdependency, I'm going to bring adaptive pressure to you to get this done so that we can both achieve. So just these kind of um, uh, like conditions um, where you can kind of better promote the, promote the uh, free information flow. So I think, I think what I'm seeing is you are kind of applying what I'm learning in the theory. Uh, so, so, and then the theory might provide some guidance on further action. So this is kind of what I'm saying. So really enjoying and conversation. I'm going to share that. Uh, actually, it's my advisor. It's the person that coined the term complex literature theory, and it just won the best paper for the last 10 years uh, in Academy of Management. Um, so it's, and also like in NSF and things, they're really starting to be a wide acceptance of this type of thinking, which I see a convergence of thought. Basically, it's in a very simple term, we no longer want hierarchical organizations. We want decentralized organizations where everybody is an informal leader and everybody participate in co-creating the future. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have to that's Thank great. you. Thank you, Gemma. Yeah, I'm very interested in, in that. You know, any uh, references you can share to to that, and I'm I'm glad that this is helpful to you as well. Uh, it seems like we're towards the end of the time. I wanted to um, show you that uh, what I'm currently doing just a couple of flyers, um, and I'd be willing to send these slides out if you wanted to look at them more in depth because I know there's a lot of material on there. And I can um, I can post the slides with your recording too. So. Okay, um, one of the things that we're we got to pull it up here on the um, flyers. Where did it? And Jim, oh, I'll send that article to them that you sent me um, from your professor. Okay, okay. great. Thank you, um, Jenna. So um, actually this week, um, we just completed this new project here called Cleveland Spaces Vital Places. And you can see the, this is the flyer and the agenda. Um, we, uh, we just started this process, but the intention here, we have a little bit of grant funding through uh, the organization Neighborhood Connections to, um, uh, uh, to invite uh, members, we're, we're, we're still talking about both residents and stakeholders, stakeholders being anyone that has some kind of a connection with a, with a neighborhood, uh, one of those, those 34 neighborhoods within the city of Cleveland, to uh, gain access to uh, uh, certain uh, land bank, bank properties within the city of Cleveland where they could put in an application and put it under a lease uh, and work with an existing uh, entity like the community development corporations or form their own nonprofit entity or something like um, down the road, a, you know, community land trust to be able to manage that land for the community. Mm -hmm. And then in designing the use of that space to do so with an intention of uh, community placemaking. So we provided, um, uh, you know, some, some examples just to stimulate the vision of what the what the possibilities are around community placemaking. And there, you know, we're looking not just in Cleveland, but in Detroit and Chicago and other places where similar activities have, 
have been undertaken. Um, and then to just uh, provide the, the tools and materials for uh, the community members themselves to be able to acquire the land, to acquire project funding, and then connecting it also to, um, to historical research. So putting community members in touch with where they can uh, find archival information about where the community's been, and then try to commit, connect the past with the present, with the future, using uh, conversations, you know, you know similar to what I did in the dissertation around c developing common vision so that what we have, instead of uh, just more of the same, you know, gentrification or, um, or uh, unraveling of community, we actually have uh, this cultivated sense of place. Uh, one of the things we talked about is bringing uh, together into conversation past residents. You know, we've had this white flight and, you know, this emptying out of the city, the, the redlining and so forth, and yet there still are some of the, the, uh, uh, the elder residents that have uh, really deep and, 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 and meaningful memories from uh, earlier times in the community and bringing those in the conversation with current community residents. So the possibilities really are endless. And, and you can see here we have that leading into other workshops, um, you know, how to maintain the places and then how to network between neighborhoods. Um, and then one other thing that I'm really excited about that's coming up on the 24th of this month, we've taken that same process into an initiative started by the, um, the Cleveland Foundation, which is one of the big philanthropic entities in Cleveland, um, called Common Ground. And on a single day, uh, uh, groups around the city are going to have simultaneous conversations around placemaking. Um, and uh, this is the second year that they're holding it. Last year, the feedback was that this was a great success. Uh, this year, we organized one of those conversations. It's just one of many that, uh, you know, that, that uh, residents and stakeholders can, can um, just show up. And um, it's, a, it's a free event. Uh, we you just find a venue and then we have conversations around community placemaking. In this case, you can see a registration. We just use Eventbrite and, and uh, see what emerges from that. Uh, this is uh, where we're going to share information about this uh, Cleveland Spaces Vital Places initiative. So, so the work continues. Um, at this point, it's all this part is all volunteer work, but it does inform my teaching and it informs, uh, you know, the um, public policy and um, uh, and the more and more, you know, as as I'm seeing this, these themes evolve. Uh, I'm also seeing some very encouraging developments around, um, uh, you know, urban planning in general. For example, the initiatives around um, green, developing green space, building green mm -hmm. infrastructure, if you will. Mm -hmm. All these things create opportunities for placemaking. Mm -hmm. And so you can start to think of placemaking as being a component of virtually any type of um, urban redevelopment initiative. So um, with that, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll stop. Um, uh, if there's any fine, further questions and I'll hand it back over to you. Yeah. Okay, great. Brett, thank you so much. This is, I wish we could talk for four hours because I think there's enough here to continue talking and coming up with more ideas. Um, if you aren't in a hurry, uh, Gemma or Jim, do you have any other questions or comments? No, I just want to thank you, Brett. It was really great to have a relaxed time for you to roll out this, you know, really deep, faceted piece of work. And um, uh, I'm really appreciative. I'm looking forward to the slides as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so thanks. But and I'm going to take my leave here. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, you, Jim. Jim. Hey. Hey. Brad, I really, really enjoyed your conversation. It's a lot of inspiration for me. And uh, um, I think I'm particularly interested in how, how you guided the conversation from more like task oriented to generative. Um, like what's the process like? Because if I want to lead a conversation like that, I would be a little bit intimidated mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, 
if, sure. if you have time, we can talk about it now. Um, if not, we can continue the conversation. Yeah, I, I have time. I, um, yeah, the, the main thing is to keep um, focusing on the questions, you know, to encourage people to value that the questions themselves, um, that, that asking the right questions, you know, and, and I, 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 in saying that, that opens up a whole other conversation because, um, um, like, what is the right question? Who decides what is the right question, right? So, um, it, it's, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge to find the, the right language to, um, to address this, this issue of um, uh, what, what does that look like when you make the pivot to a more generative conversation? Questions are open-ended so that, so uh, if you focus on the questions, then that becomes uh, generative, but also the space is important, the, both the physical and the, you know, and the, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, the interpersonal space that's created by having agreements. Um, one thing I did mention is you do want to have agreements around the dialogue. So providing a little bit of an introduction to what generative dialogue is in theory, and then inviting the participants to uh, co-create some ground rules around that dialogue um, is, is very useful because um, what I have found is uh, it's, you, you don't really tend to um, have to invoke those rules very often, but just knowing that those agreements are there helps to create a sense of security and safety within the group. And then also to uh, maybe do a little bit of forecasting or, or kind of setting the stage by mentioning that up front, early in the process as a facilitator, that, that um, the feeling of tension or the feeling of a, a little bit of dis mild discomfort in the mm -hmm. conversation is actually a desirable thing because that in itself is generative. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's if it's handled right, uh, one w one way that I use to describe that is uh, by analogy to describe, you know, to ask members of the group whether they've ever been part of a, a truly gr creative group process, like putting on a school play or um, working on some kind of project at work where they had to do it as a team, you know, to 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 create something um, together, and that. Uh, or, or, or as an artist, if they've ever done something you know, that involves artistic expression, where they're collaborating around that, that it, um, I, I think most people, if they draw from memory, they can, and, and, and are invited to do so, can, um, can remember what it felt like to be in that creative space with other people, that there's like a birthing process you know, you, you're reaching for something together, and and that does feel um, a little bit uncomfortable because you're not quite there. You're trying, you know, you you're trying to work through the interpersonal dynamics, easy, even as you're trying to coalesce around a common goal. Um, sports is another one. So, so helping people to connect to what is most accessible in their lives, that is analogous to the kind of feeling that um, that might emerge in a generative conversation and then help them to, to remember the value that came out of that so that the discomfort is not just felt as a negative, like, like I'm already stressed out by other life demands. Now you're gonna ask me to be, to enter into a difficult conversation, you know, if, if that's all that the information they're given, that's going to be the last thing they're going to want to do. But Brett, so, didn't you, Brett, didn't you find though that the comp, that, that uneasiness quickly was transformed into, wow, this is a powerful interaction. Yeah. You know, it, it just sort of like, like when I did my, um, I called them collective conversations for my practicum. Right. The, the women, you know, were like, oh, I don't know about this. But by the time, I mean, like, 
before even halfway through the conversation, they were like, wow, this is pretty, this is pretty great, you know? Yeah. I, I have, I found that well, both within the, the, the dissertation and, and in, in other areas of engagement, which says to me that people are hungry for this. That yeah, not, exactly. They're waiting for this. And so when they experience just even a taste of, mm -hmm. of getting through a conversation that is generative, it's exciting and, and right. it feeds positive energy. You gonna say something, Gemma? So this could happen uh, just within one conversation if you do it properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. the, yes. I think the key is you're curious, you're honestly and sincerely curious and you're present. I, I think those are the mm. two key. And, it, and so if it's part of a, multi, you know, a, a process involving more than one gatherings, such as what I did here in the dissertation, um, you know, what one uh, consideration as a facilitator is uh, what you set as your goals or what you invite the, the group to set as its goals. You want mm -hmm. to try to be realistic of, you know, how much time do you, are you going to have together? How much, how far do you expect to get? If you don't want to oversell the process in the sense of setting expectations that, that um, would take a much longer period of time to get to. But even in the context of a single conversation, um, you can see with, with good facilitation, um, uh, some, some, some very beneficial outcomes. And I'm reflecting on the first uh, gathering that I had, uh, which was part of the convening process. Uh, one of the things that emerged was I realized I came prepared to give a presentation, you know, of a lot of theory and so forth. And I had to uh, adjust when I very quickly when I realized that I was convening a group of people that had never been in the same room before that you know so um, they needed space to introduce themselves to each other and to kind of figure out what you know what this process was all about and as we started doing introductions and as we started setting those common intentions the conversation was already on and for me to as a facilitator to say okay i'm going to cut off this conversation so that i can give you this this mm -hmm. prepackaged presentation would be counterproductive mm -hmm. so i didn't do that i i i adapted and said well what what we're trying to do here you know is and what's what's already starting to happen here in way of conversations and sharing and, and setting common intentions is exactly what this process is about. So I try to connect the, you know, the, 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 um, the intention going in with what was actually emerging. And if you do that, they of course require a skill that we're always, you know, we're continually trying to hone as facilitators. But um, I, I guess another way to say that is that from the very first meeting, one of the ingredients is how present you are as a facilitator mm -hmm. to what is emerging and just flow with that and allow you know, and give it space to emerge on its own organic mm -hmm. uh, pattern. Yep. Yep. I agree. And, All then, right. and then that would continue so, through subsequent yeah. meetings. Yep. And Thank so you very I much. Connected. They're very helpful. Yeah. I connected all of you, um, Gemma and Brett and Jim, um, and sent that article that you had sent me. So um, I'm sure Brett would, you know, be happy for you to reach out to him if you have other questions. And sure. um, so anyway, but thank you, Brett, very much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you and, I, and uh, 